Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, and welcome to a very special extra interview, a final cut. Today, I'm joined by an actor who is actually familiar to gamers of recent, because if you have played Ghost of Tsushima, this gentleman's voice will sound quite familiar. He's also done more TV than I could possibly watch in a week, and he's played a Till of a Hunt. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the voice of Kutu Khan, Patrick Gallagher. All right, and, and the face and the body, too. So, yep. Now, all the gamers nice. who have played it get to see the, the real uh, Kotu Khan and see That's what right. you like. So, That's so firstly, right. how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thank you very much. So, how did you get started out in acting? Well, I came out of a very, I'm half Chinese, half Irish. I came out of a very educated family. There's university degrees on both sides, all generations. I did well in school, but I just didn't feel like going to university. So honestly, I just auditioned for a theater program in my hometown of Vancouver just to get people off my ass. Got into that, um, decided to audition for the National Theater School of Canada and got into that. And as they say, the rest is history. I always loved it because my father was a, was a, was a, um, a Chaucer Shakespeare professor. My mother was a teacher and a musician. So the family is pretty artistic. It just didn't occur to me that it could be a viable career until I got into the National Theatre School of Canada and then got out and started working. And I've been really fortunate that I punched my last time clock at a regular job, one of 20 or so, on Mother's Day of 2002, been able to make a living at it ever since. So I'm very fortunate. Happy 18 years in the business, sir. Thank you. So you've done a, fair, you've done a bit of movies. So you've done Master and Commander with Russell Crowe, Sideways with Paul Giamatti and Thomas Hayden Church. You've done Final Destination 3. You've also done Captain Marvel. So you've got a pretty much nice, diverse film collection there that you've been in. Yeah, it's, uh, and Master and Commander holds a really special place in my heart because that's the job I punched my last time clock to do. And what an amazing experience, you know, to work with Peter Weir and, and, and Russell Crowe. And it changed how I thought a lot because... When we audition, they send us breakdowns, which is descriptions of characters. Mm -hmm. And this one said 1805 Welsh. And I was like, are you people crazy? I mean, look at my damn face. And somehow I got that job and it, it, it changed how I thought about it. It made, it real, made me realize that anything is possible. You just have to go out and not put up any more. We have enough obstacles in front of us as actors anyways, without putting up new ones. And I mean, Peter Weir is an incredible talent. Russell Crowe is an incredible talent. It was all British actors. I had, to, I had to do a Welsh accent, which I knew I could get past the Americans, but my proudest moment is I got it past you guys. And you guys believed it. When that's not an easy accent to do, because my understanding there's about four Welsh accents, and apparently I pulled off one of them. So I was quite proud of that. Yeah, I must admit, um, Americans doing English accents aren't really good. I mean, look at Alicia Silverstone in Batman and Robin. Absolutely terrible. Yeah. Well, I don't know why we're so bad at it and you guys are so good at doing ours. Maybe it's easier accent to do. Maybe it's you see more of our television. But yeah, we're not really that great at it. Um, actually, my dad was a, was a bit of a linguist and he, did, he worked on accents. He did say that because the American accent or the North American accent is so flat, it is easier to actually mimic. Mm. Um, and it's harder for us because we're not used to hearing lilts and, and tone changes. It's harder for us to do other accents, theoretically. But yeah, I got the Welsh accent past you guys, so I was very proud of that. We are quite, we are quite hard to please, but nice to see that uh, you've surprised us. So all high standards, and you should yeah. be very proud of it. So you played the Tilda in the Three Nights of a Museum movies. So how easy is it doing a movie like that, where you have to sort of like stay still for a lot of it, and then for the other lot of it, you have to actually, yeah, like literally have to act. So how difficult is it playing a character like that? Well, you know, it's part of the business. I mean, a lot of the business is, uh, you know, if you've ever been on a set, you'll, most of it is standing around, you know, and, and you, you have lots of periods of inactivity and they're resetting shots and, you know, you, you've got to cover somebody else. So then you're off camera, you got to be there for them. So you kind of get used to that. What was hard about that is most of that was improv. You know, the, the, the originally he spoke English and somehow they decided to do this, this made up language. And then I just started doing it myself. And it, it, that was the fun part of it is it literally got to the point at number three where it would just be Attila and such and such do something and we would just make it up. And I would just make the language up as I went along. It, I don't like it being called gibberish because um, to me, it was a language he was speaking. The key yeah. to that was I was always thinking in my head what I was trying to say. Um, 
And I think that makes a huge difference. Cause if I was just saying making sounds, you're not going to get it, but mm. I would just always have an intention in my head what I'm trying to do. And I would have fun with it. I swear in it in places just to entertain myself. So if you listen really carefully, there's swear words in it. <laughs> and I would ask people where their grandmother was born and what town and they give it to me. So I put their town in into the language. Yeah. I said Krispy Kreme once cause someone said I couldn't do it. And I said, I'll throw Krispy Kreme in. You won't even notice it. So. Did you swear with Ben still of it in, in that made up language? No, he was great. And that whole scene was so much fun because we just literally just ran together and then just, that just happened. Mm. You know, we, we didn't really plan much other than we're going to run together and go. And that's what was so exciting about that job for me. The costume was a nightmare. That's the worst word. I mean, so, something like that usually is, I can imagine. <laughs> Just move away from the move from the movies, basically. You've done a lot of TV in in your career. There's been RoboCop, which if anybody is listening or watching, it's not the movie with Peter Weller. It, there was a TV series in the '90s, which I actually watched, and I did okay. actually like it. Yeah, I it was my it. first job ever. Yep, there's Earth Final Conflict. There was FX the series, Stargate Atlantis, True Blood, Entourage, Glee, Hawaii Five-0. Ent- I've put Entourage twice, sorry about that. Suits and I Zombie, Fuller House, Lucifer, SWAT, Station 19. So you've literally d- near enough done everything. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm what they call a, a character actor, you know, and, um, you know, I'd like to get more series. I'm starting to get more recurring characters now, which I like. Um, and I've had a diverse or er, 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 a diverse run of characters, which is nice. I mean, you know, it keeps me working. You know, I, uh, like I said, I'm now pushing to try to, yeah, I've had a couple of series that went for a year in Canada and then got canceled, a couple of pilots like everybody else. But yeah, I've been, I've been pretty fortunate because, you know, we, we, the one nice thing about this industry is when I was younger, all those were like cop one and I was playing the young uniform cop. I have a joke that a guy like me can judge how old they are because you start out playing a beat cop then you're a detective. Then one day you're the captain. And all of a sudden you're like the guy who owns a bar used to be a cop. And I'm so close to that age now. Um, but yeah, it's, I've been very fortunate. And Robocop was my first job ever. That was the first time I actually was on a set and got paid and I screwed it up. I had one line, which was come with me. And I didn't know the difference between a master and a close up. So I grabbed them with my right hand and said, come with me. And then when we got to the close up, it was supposed to be the left hand. And I've never forgotten that. It wasn't my fault because they're supposed to tell me that stuff, but I, so that's I, why I said to myself, be aware of it. I blame the production company anyway. It's like, fair enough, you did that, but they should have said, uh, right, with your, right, with your left hand, go, come with me. That's it. It's, that's yeah. It. yeah, it was somebody else's job, but it was interesting because I've never forgotten it because, you know, as an actor, I think we should try to know that as best we can, make it as easy for the editors as we can, make you know, make it as smooth as we possibly can. So I always try to remember continuity. You know, did I put this hand here when? Yeah. You know, you need to be able to cut it together. And, you know, even, even if you're not exactly right, they can generally do it. But you don't want to lose a moment because you literally put, you know, they just can't cut it because it's going to be so egregious where you're, that your hand is in a different spot. So, so I, I learned from that. Uh, speaking of TV, you've got a recurring role on General Hospital. So... Well, I had one episode. That was a that was a bucket list thing for me. Mm. Well, because look at my, it's been going for seven years. It's got fourteen thousand episodes, and it's still going. So it's still going. Yeah. Were well, you just back in awe when you actually went, "Wow, I'm on a show that's been going for fifty over fifty seven years, and it's done fourteen thousand episodes, if not more than that, because it was two years since I got that stuff." Yeah, I was aware of that, and it's funny because for me, it really was kind of a bucket list thing because I'm not. I'm not the face that gets on soap operas. And I just wanted to be on one. And my manager knew the um, producer. And so they found a role for me. And I was, it was, it was exactly that. Like, this is an iconic show. And I wanted to just say, at some point I did one of them. And I was really happy to do it. And it's a very different experience than any other acting experience. I mean, it's, it's like nothing else. It's a whole genre and way of working onto itself to do, uh, uh, to do a soap opera. It was fun. You also did uh, Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone for an episode, I believe. What is, Jordan, yeah. what is Jordan Peele like as far as that series goes? Well, I met him once. We had the same birthday. Oh, all right. Uh, he, he's very funny. And I did have a Jordan Peele story that I reminded him of, that I was doing Bucket and Skinner's Epic Adventure, I guess back in 2011. And I was out 
on the lot on a break having a cigarette and these two guys walk by and I started talking to them and I said oh what are you guys doing here I said oh we just you know we have a show we're just starting it hasn't started yet we're just airing it and it was Key and Peel I didn't realize that I met Key and Peel before that show had aired uh-huh. um, he was great I mean he was really funny um, he's a very nice guy it was a really that was a fun job to do as well that's that was also back in Vancouver which is where I am now which is my hometown so it's always nice to come back to my hometown and get out of America. I was going to say Vancouver is home of the Arrowverse as well. So can we possibly see you in the Arrowverse anytime soon? The which? It's where you have Arrow, Legends of Tomorrow, Flash, uh, Super. Oh, yeah. Arrow, yeah. It's over these. I'm, hope- I'm hoping to get on those. You know, there's some shows that I just can't seem to crack. I took a shot at Supernatural about 10 times and got close and just never could cra- crack that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I'll be on one of those because those things are fun to do. I love doing fantasy stuff i did captain marvel just because i'm a fan i mean it was a really small part but i'm like i just want to be in one because i love those movies so well to be fair i've always said marvel has the best movies but dc has the best animated movies because all the animated movies i've got a load actually and i do actually find that they're a lot better than marvel's uh, cartoon stuff so i will say i did enjoy captain marvel a lot even being back to the 90s was a nice touch i'll be honest yeah yeah it was uh i just wanted to be in one of them because i love those movies and i've watched them all i watched them in order during the lockdown i just said i'm just gonna watch all the marvel again so i watched them straight through from iron man in order i got i had a lot i had a lot of time in my hands like we all did so yeah we all did yeah so and i didn't know this but you were on hell's kitchen on the 100th episode or dinner service as they're called so yeah yeah so i do need to ask this but i'm sure i know what the answer is how loud is Gordon Ramsay, and would you ever do a celebrity version of that show? Well, they, uh, they this was a scrape in the bottom of the barrel for celebrities, so I don't, you know, I guess they had to just get somebody, and I went for the free food. Um, he was loud. I never met him, but he was loud um, when he was doing it. We heard a little bit of it, but honestly, we were kind of separate, and we just ate a little bit, and then they yeah. shot stuff. I mean, it's like anything else. You know, they reset and go. Yeah. Um, I would love to do a celebrity version of anything. You know, I, and I'm sort of bummed because my dream is being Jeopardy. And here's my problem. I'm well known enough that I can't just be a regular guy, but I'm not well known enough that I can be a celebrity Jeopardy. So I need like D-list Jeopardy or something. That's what I'm hoping they get, you know, because yeah. I want to be on that show because I could win it. Ask me a question. I could win it. It's probably true. So now... There, there is more there's more than just movies and tv ladies and gentlemen this guy's actually been in a few video games there's been obviously there was a night of the museum video game obviously you've done halo reach red dead redemption tom clancy's ghost recon breakpoint which i actually played the beta for must have been not, not impressed with the game as such because it was just like any other ubisoft game but yeah most recently you've been in ghost of Tsushima. so as far as franchises go you did a few decent ones I've been lucky. Breakpoint, I really enjoyed. That was, uh, Ubisoft is a great company to work for. I got to be in Montreal, which I love. The Night Museum one is interesting because I don't, I tried to play it. I couldn't find myself. I never did it. So if anybody's played it and they actually use my voice, let me know because they owe me money if they did because I had nothing to do with that. Like, I was like, what the hell video game are they talking about? And I tried to play it and I could never really find it. So if anybody's played it and it was my voice, just send me a little message. Um, yeah. Comments in the section below, and I'll send him a link so he can. Okay, thanks. But yeah, it was I. You know, it's a it's a whole new area that's opened up for actors to do performance capture because mm-hmm. sometimes it's just the voice. Um, yeah. And this, which I don't mind, which is a lot of what the Halo Reach stuff was, just coming in, going, "Hey, get down!" And but Breakpoint was my first. Um, performance capture where you're in that skin tight suit which nobody should have to see me in including myself but it's inevitable it's unavoidable mm-hmm. and that's a really interesting way of working because it's it's very different than anything else we do you know and it takes a little bit of time to adjust to um because you've got the big cameras in front of your face so it yeah. can't be as intimate as it used to be and you know i got some good advice from someone who's there which really helped me he basically said listen this is more about how you move in your voice than, than, than the way we act on television. And that really helped a lot, that it still becomes about our voice. Because you saw me, I look nothing like Mad Schultz. You know, they made me look like some really gruff, rugged looking cowboy guy, which I wish I looked like, you know? And so it became about the voice and how you move. And, and uh, but it's fun, you know? I really enjoyed it. And Ghost of Tsushima was 
such a fun experience. Now, we did actually discuss this before we uh, did before we came on air. So, were you a gamer before you took any of the roles? I was a gamer up until the first PlayStation, and then I could never figure out how to play first-person shooter, and I moved away from it. But now I'm interested again because the open world part of it is what interests me. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't have a PlayStation. I kept dropping hints to Sony, but I guess they didn't get my hints. I think you have to do a bit better hints then. <laughs> yeah. So what I might do is I might uh, I might just wait till the five comes out and buy a cheap four because um, I do want to play this. Um, and I've got friends who got it, but yeah, I'm not really a gamer, but I'm getting interested in it again because it's, it's the story part of it that interests me now. And that's what I, I might start getting into it now. So I recently bought, um, the two doom games when I just, when I went shopping today and I must admit, I do love first person shooters, but you have to pick the right ones. I mean, Call of Duty do a brilliant campaign, but multiplayer is just, oh, it's Mm. like one of the worst things ever. Yeah. Stuff like Guild Wars interests me too. Like I don't know what they're called, but there there's some term for games that are always on. Yeah. You no know, War of the Worlds. That kind of stuff I find interesting. It's the gameplay isn't what really gets me. It's all the stuff around it. And so that's why I'm kind of getting interested in in it again. You know, I was a big Dungeons and Dragons guy when I was a kid. What a guy. So that kind of stuff is what appeals to me. So. I recommend the uh, Rocksteady Batman Arkham games. The okay. Because they are. I have literally got all three twice and they are probably one of the best games that i've ever played as long as you don't mind uh, like third person fighter games then that's they're perfect for you so which ones are they batman it's batman arkham asylum batman arkham city and batman arkham knight okay and what what platform are they on the uh, ps4 xbox sweet yeah i'll look at i'll look for them i'll send you a link so Speaking of games, um, if anyone has actually played Ghost of Tsushima, I actually do know someone who has. Patrick's voice may sound familiar because he plays, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Kotu Khan, the main Kotun. antagonist. Kotun Khan. Kotun yes. Khan. Kotun Khan. Do you surrender? So you played an ex-Marine in the Ghost Recon Breakpoint and the grandson of Genghis Khan in Ghost of Tsushima. How much fun is it to voice both a hero and a villain? It's a lot of fun. Go, uh, Koten Khan was especially fun because the writing was really great and they gave me a lot of leeway to try to bring some depth to him. So I, my big thing about it was not to play him as a marauding savage. You know, I tried to play him a bit like a bureaucrat. He just had a job to do. You know, it's like, I just want to get this done. And what he used whatever tactics he could to try to, you know, achieve this um, invasion. And it was a lot of fun. And, you know, he was also a bad guy, which is fun to play too. Yeah, I mean, it was really I got to pretend burn people, you know, and, and cut people's heads off and stab people and, you know, be in charge of everything. So you get, to, you know, that's part of the fun of acting is you get to play that kind of stuff. It's, you know what it is? It's, we all did it when we were little kids. We just get paid to do yeah, what we when we were little kids, you know, and it's what a, what a, what a gift. Did you do any motion capture for the game? If so, how easy is it? Yeah, because performance capture means it's your voice and motion capture. So I, for that one, I did both. And it's, it takes a bit of getting used to because, and this is where Attila the Hun really helped me. People ask what, how, what the relationship was. They're not the same character at all. Attila the Hun was completely made up. But what really helped me was remembering wearing a 45-pound hot costume. And so even though you're wearing just this skin-tight thing, I got that sense of how, how to walk with armor on. Because when you do the performance capture, you know, you have to, you're in an empty room. So you've got to imagine where the, where the castle is. You've got to imagine where these things are. So, you know, they'll tell you, this is where the castle is going to be. You've got to look and pretend, but you're basically in this empty square. Um, And like I said, you had, you know, I was always conscious of how do how am I walking with, 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 you know, all the armor on, how do I swing a sword? You got to make, you got to try to get a sense of heaviness to, to this, you know, foam thing you've got. So I like doing both of them. I don't particularly like doing just motion capture, which I won't do again. Cause you know, I, luckily I don't, I did it once for get my health care. I like doing the voiceover. Yeah. America, you got to earn money to make health care. It's ridiculous. It's a yeah. backward society. Um, I like doing the voiceover cause it's quick and easy. I like to do both of them because then you can form a real full, 
fully thought out and fully alive character. And that to me is the most fun. And it resonates more as well, because if you have somebody who doesn't, who you think doesn't look like they sound, then it yeah. kind of takes away from it as well. Yeah. And that's, what's interesting about, about Ghost Recon is they, you know, some of them, sometimes they use our actual faces, which yeah. I guess is rarer than I thought, which is Ghost of Tsushima, which is basically my face. And that's a lot of dots, you know, that's hundreds of them. Um, for Breakpoint, they can put whatever face they want on us. And so therefore, again, that's where I talked about it, it becomes all the voice and how you move, but I didn't look anything like that. You know, you can kind of see it in the eyes. And so, um, the, when I first started doing them, it was new territory and I had to learn a little bit of it, but I think I've got a pretty good handle on it. So I'd like to do more. Plus you get to travel, especially with Ubisoft, you know, damn COVID. I love, there's not, I love Montreal. I'll do any job that involves an airplane. So that's basically, if you're going to put me in an airplane in a hotel, I'm pretty much going to do whatever acting job you've got. Cause that's one of my favorite things. An acting job in Australia, that would be a nice uh, work. Oh. I would love that. Honestly, I would fly. I would just, I would, I live in LA. I would just be happy to go to Ogden, Utah, if I'm on an airplane, you know, I just like traveling. So. All right. Uh, just, a, just a question. Um, obviously I'll say you're the first guy I've really interviewed about playing a video game character. How does the casting process for a video game go? Cause it, is it any different to like, if you were, if you're auditioning for like film or TV, or is it completely different? Not from what I can tell. To me, it felt exactly the same. We walked in, we had the lines, and you make the character, and you make the choices that you think will, will fit this character, and then you leave. So to me, now, that's for performance capture, where physicality will matter. Um, for when it's just voice, it just comes down to voice. And a lot of that is technical skill. I've gotten a lot of voice jobs because I went to theater school and I can yell for two hours without losing my voice. You know, that's really what it comes down to. You play a teacher. Yeah. I mean, it's just using your diaphragm. But a lot of people, like somebody said to me once, I can't believe you yelled for two hours and your voice sounds the same. And a lot of actors don't know, who haven't trained, will get their throat raw. And then your voice starts to sound different, which isn't helpful when you're trying to be the same person. Mm. But yeah, from what I can tell, I've auditioned for a lot of video games. I think I've done two in audition for 10 or something like that. And it seems exactly the same process to me. Fair it's just the only difference is the voice is slightly more important than, yeah. and you can't be as subtle, but it's the same process of making a choice, who this character, what's your objective, what are you trying to do? All that stuff is the same. So you mentioned your bucket list earlier. So as far as uh, video gaming franchises or games go, what would you like to be on your bucket list? Well, from what I understand, Last of Us is a big game, which is sort of on my bucket list because that's the one I did only motion capture for to get my health care in 2008. But I'd like to actually do performance capture on that one. I didn't know there were Dune games. I love those books. I'd like to be in that. And I'm a, big Star, I'm a big Star Trek fan, so I'd like to be in a Star Trek one. Would you do Call of Duty? Because there's literally like a new game every single year. Yeah, I'd like to do I'd like to do one of those two. I honestly don't know enough about them to really answer that question, but um the ones I've heard I know that Last of Us is a big big game and people love that one. So, I'd like to actually have my voice in maybe one of those. Just to give you an idea, Call of Duty, well, it did start off originally in like World War 1s and World War 2s. It's Done, they've done Modern Warfare, which is set in the modern day. They've done Advanced Warfare, which is kind of set in the future. They went back to World War II. Uh, this year, they've done Black Ops as well, which is set during the Cold War. And they've done Black Ops 2 and 3, which was sort of set in the future and 1980. But That's cool. The newest one this year is, I think it's sort of like set before, set between, uh, I think I'm right in saying this, don't. Don't, go, don't quote me on this. And don't hammer me in the comments if I've got this wrong, but it's between Black Ops 1 and 2. So it was, I think it was before Vietnam and just by the Cold War. So it's basically USA against Russia. So there's a new game every year, mate. And the Zombies mode, they basically have the best of the best for casting. I mean, Charles Dance has done it. Charles Dance has done it. Um, John Malkovich has done it. Uh, Oh, what's his name? Uh, John Berthnell, who was actually in Ghost uh, Recon Breakpoint. He's done it. Uh, oh, God. Uh, there's been those guys, get the, those, guys, those yeah. guys get the real money. There's a real pay disparity between people with names and, and, and sort mm -hmm. of running little actors, which to get a little off topic is something that the industry's got to change, you know, mm -hmm. because 
the amount of money video games make and the amount of money that they pay actors who aren't well known to do it is it's kind fun. of scandalous, actually. So, I mean, I mean Rockstar Games, who make uh, Grand Theft Auto, they've made billions over the twenty years that um, Grand Theft Auto has yeah. been going. It's just, and if you're if you're a big star, they're going to pay you big money. You know, Morgan Freeman or whoever is, you know. I don't know what I would assume they're going to get hundreds of thousands. Someone like me is going to, they're going to try to get us for a thousand bucks a day. And it's just, it's just, it's just wrong yeah, it is. in my, in my, in my opinion. And you know, that's something that the unions need to look at. And, you know, I mean, how about every 50 million bucks, you just pay us our salary again. How about that? Nice, wouldn't it? You know, so that's, that's sort of what my focus, that's the one, that's the other thing I learned from doing them is how egregious as much fun as they are. And I really appreciated the job and loved it, but, Damn, they've made five hundred million dollars already. Mm. You know, but there's always people who are like, "Oh, you voice Kotu, uh, Wutu Khan," and it's kind of like, "I really thought you were really, really good in that." I was really impressed. It's always kind of nice to hear that, though, knowing that it is. how you've done has kind yeah. of actually, kind of actually, uh, I was not so much impressed people, but kind of like, been, yeah, he's played, he's done really well in that. Well, yeah, thank you. And don't get me wrong. And that's the one part I'm really happy to be in. And I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud to be part of it. I loved it. I'm just saying in general in the industry, uh, you know, the, the, the acting unions have got to sit there and figure how, how to figure out something about this disparity, you know, because it costs less money to make a video game than it does to make a movie. And we get residuals on movies and there's, there's less of a profit margin, you know. Well, put it this way. If Joe Biden gets selected, there's going to be a bit, there will be some change. I hope so. I'm not even, honestly, I'm not even worried. It's like waiting for Christmas for me. I'm not a big Trump fan by any means. I'm not even worried about it. It's just a matter of how big the, the loss is for him. Yeah. So it's like waiting for Christmas for me. Hopefully he'll be out of office. But then again. He will. It's, the big worry is what he's going to do in the interim. I, I, I think that there's no question he's going to lose. I mean, there's just more of us than there are of them. It's just what he's going to do afterwards. And there's more he, celebrities that are um, getting behind Joe Biden as well. Because I think yeah. Taylor Swift put a vote, vote behind him. I think a lot of. Well, but Trump's got Scott Baio. Oh, who cares? I know. He's got Scott Baio. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I can feel it. I, it it's it's going to be an overwhelming defeat for him because we're just, can I swear on this? If you want, I'll just, put, a, I'll just put like a... 15 or a rated R rating on it. So you're fine. We're just fucking tired of that bullshit. I'm just fucking tired of it. And it's time for it to end. So that's my political statement. Right. So let's move away from your career and the Trump. Trumpinator, as I like to call it. Yes. Yes. So this next section is everything is what it's what I ask all my guests. It's just a little bit of advice for people who for a little bit of advice, future highlights, what you'd like, future holders, et cetera, et cetera. So I have actually felt this way. This is why I asked this question. So, so if somebody feels they're getting nowhere with their career, what advice would you give to them to not give up? Keep going. Yeah. Cause we all feel that I felt that. I mean, I felt I that, that just before uh, master and commander. and I felt that after master and commander, you're going to feel that you need to just keep going and you need to not, Again, it's that whole thing I talked about. There's so many things against us. Don't put up any more obstacles hmm. than, than you have to. Don't, you know, it doesn't matter what your age is. You never tell yourself, I'm too old, I'm too this. You just are who you are and just be who you are, have faith in yourself and keep going. I can't guarantee that you're going to make it, but I can guarantee that if you don't believe you can make it, you're not going to. Um, if you love it, just do it. You know, take it... And this is going to sound a bit contradictory. You need to follow your own path and go to the beat of your own drummer, but you also need to understand the things you don't know and take advice when it's warranted, you know, but at the same token, go with your own gut, you know, and just stand somewhere. I think the best thing you can do is try not to figure out what they want, show them who you are and, 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 and carve your own place in this industry. That, happened with me is I used to play a lot of thugs and bad guys. It was cop three, thug two. I got lucky in sideways where I was able to show a different aspect to who I am. I'm not that tough guy. People look at it and those, those parts are hard for me to play. Yeah. But I always knew that I wasn't that. And once I got that role, I started focusing on it and I was able to play stuff like Kentanaka and stuff with a little more sensitivity, something more psychological. 
um, you, you need to be who you are and, and, and you can kind of just say, here I am, and you can make your own place in it. Um, and don't worry about, don't put more, the, I can't stress this enough. Don't put up more obstacles than are already there. Never say I've just done student films. Never diminish anything you've done because they're going to diminish us enough. You're going to feel diminished enough by this industry. Don't diminish yourself. And I honestly believe this. I'm no more of an actor than someone who's in theater school right now. To me, whether you're an actor or not is not based on how much you've worked. It's a lifestyle and it's a decision. It's the dream I respect, not the results. So just believe in yourself and keep going. Flip side of that is, if, is there's also nothing wrong with at some point realizing this isn't for you. You know, don't leave too early, but don't leave too late. Leave on your terms at all. We're, this is a solitary industry. Ironically, we work together in groups on set. We work together in teams to make, to make magic, to make, tell stories. But ultimately, this is a solitary, in my mind, a solitary industry. And you need to trust yourself and be there for yourself and only compete with yourself. That's what I would say. Sound advice. Yeah. So obviously we've been going through a pandemic. We still are, and cinemas are shut in left, right, and centre. Some yeah. are shut again. So, do you think the time has come for cinemas to be abolished and just basically everything be bought out by Apple TV, Netflix, Amazon Prime, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I hope to God not, because you know, stuff like Master and Commander, stuff like um, Marvel movies, stuff like uh, Christopher Nolan stuff stuff like Mulan, you want to see that on a big screen. Part of the experience is, is the huge screen and, 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 and the sound. And the fact is, you know, unless you put it in 16.9, you're not going to see how that movie was shot. The only way you're in, even on 16.9, you're not seeing the amazing work that the director of photography and, and all the lighting guys and the set directors do and the directors do to make that, movie the way it is i i hope to god that they don't and i'll still go see small movies in movie theaters because it's a fun experience you know it reminds me of being a kid you go you get a seat you've got this huge screen you get popcorn um i think unfortunately a lot of them are going to go away it's going to be a long time before i feel comfortable doing it although ironically apparently now is the best time i have friends who went and you're the only person in there so if you want to go see a movie in a movie theater, now's the time to go. It is, honestly, I went in when Tenant was released over here, and I must admit, it is actually nice to have peace and quiet and not have any yeah. mobile phone go off. And also, when I was young, it was sort of my refuge, you know? I, I went through the, all the teenage angst that everyone did, and, and I just love the escape aspect of it. I think that's where I kind of fell in love with it a little bit, mm. you know, that, sure, I mean, we're not, we're, we don't, we're, we're not as important to the world necessarily as police officers or firefighters or, or doctors, but there's something noble in what artists do and that the fact that they can make stories that can help move people or help people forget their troubles. And when I was 16 years old and my, my parents were getting divorced and I was going through all that stuff, I used to just love those two hours in an afternoon movie by myself to just kind of lose myself, you know, and I would be ashamed if that goes away, you know, and it's going to be diminished, but I hope they stay. I'll tell you one thing, a new Bond movie is going to have to going to have to be released soon because it apparently I'm not sure if it's per day or per week but it's losing like a million in interest by not being released oh. yeah yeah I heard a podcast about that and I think they're going to start coming to do it I mean all the Trump people are going to go so release it uh, I'll stay home thanks very much and, and not go to one of their super spreader movie events but yeah I think people are hungry for it and hopefully sooner than later we can get a vaccine and get this under control and bring this stuff back because you know I, I like the quality. There's something about television and, and the quality of storytelling, but there's something about the spectacle of a, of a huge movie that, that I think we need and I need and I want to go see. So, yeah, same here, man. so I know we've talked a lot about your career, but what would your highlights of your career be? Wow. Nighty Museum has got to be one of them. I mean, I, you know, to be on a huge franchise like that is an experience that I wish every actor could get because it's like nothing else. You know, it's just the, the amount of resources they have, the amount of people you get to work with. I mean, it's just, it, you get to travel. I mean, I got to fly 
you know, that's, I've been on pods four times in my life and it's always, you know, the first class pods is always shooting stuff and I love it. You know, we got to shoot in London and New York. That was a pretty big one. Um, honestly, my first Robocop was my first television acting job. My first ever professional day was January 7th, 1994. I was doing a play at a theater called Young People's Theater in Toronto. That was honestly a momentous day for me because that was my first day as a professional actor. I think I was 25 years old. It was kind of like, right, I've got this. I have officially arrived as an actor. Yeah. And then, you know, that whole run of Master Commander Sideways, that period, and Glee, you know, uh, you know, that, that was all really fun. And that, that was all, I learned a lot on those, you know. I mean, Master Commander, like I said, was, was the one job that, that made it so I didn't have to do a regular job again. And so that, that has a special place in my heart too. So, you know, but honestly, I think when I started working is when I didn't get bitter. I mean, they're all highlights. I know it sounds corny, oh, but, but literally every day is a highlight. I mean, look what I get to do. I mean, they're paying me money to just go do this thing. And that's the other thing I would advise people is, is try not to get bitter because bitterness will kill you. And I went through a period where I got a little bit bitter and there's a difference between being fr even frustrated and you can be a little bit frustrated. You can be a little bit angry. Don't get bitter because that will kill your career. And I had to adjust. I had to leave Toronto to get out of bitterness. And there was a couple of periods in, you know, 10 years ago. Once I conquered that, for lack of a better term, that's when you really start to work because you can't be embarrassed about being enthusiastic. I mean, this is a great, I mean, look what they fucking... I go on set and I get to pretend I'm somebody else and they pay us pretty good money and they give us free food. You can't really get much better than that. What more could you ask for? What more, seriously, what more could you ask for? And I, and I honestly, every day I go on set, I stand around for one second and go, this is a good day. Mm. And then it's because it's a gift. It really is. And there's so many people that would like to do what I want to do. And I always try to remind myself of that, you know, how fortunate I am. I'm not saying that I don't deserve it. I'm sure there's a, I've worked hard. Um, but I am very fortunate to be able to do something that I love to do. I know what it's like. I used to work in a hotel as a doorman in Toronto during a film festival and people would, it's one of those hotels where people who were shooting TV shows would stay at. And I remember what that felt like, that pit in my stomach, like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And I like to remember that sometimes to realize that now I'm that guy and I was able to do it. But somebody was like me going, I want to do that and how fortunate I am to be able to do it. So. All right. Um, have you got any any work coming up over the next couple of months to a year? Yeah, there's a uh, Christmas Chronicles two comes out on Netflix, November twenty fifth with Kurt Russell, where I play a dancing security guard. I will have to watch that. My lady loves Christmas. She yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I'm on something now that I'm not. If I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say because we signed these weird NDAs and I haven't yeah. really heard whether I'm not. There's something coming up on. ABC. Yeah, there's something coming up soon that it's going to be a pretty big show. I just don't know whether I'm allowed to talk about it and I haven't gotten an answer about it. So a big American television show that I'm well, working we'll on. Leave it at that. We don't need it. If you're not sure, there's no point disclosing it. Don't need yeah. it. But we yeah. do. But it, it opens. It, it's open too soon. So. So what would you like the future to hold for you as in good health, lots of money, family to stay safe yeah honestly uh i like being single but i wouldn't mind getting getting my personal life and having some changes in that it'd be nice it'd be nice to to you know find a woman who's smarter than i am and stronger than i am and be able to share some some time with that mine's you know? definitely i want to be me. take my word for it sorry mine's that my lady is definitely smarter than me take my right, word. Yeah. so i i'd like to i'd like to fall in love be happy, make a lot of money. How's that? And, um, and no Trump. Indeed. So if people want to find you on social media and congratulate you on your career, how would they go about it? Well, I am on Instagram. I'm not certified or verified. I don't know why they won't do it. So it's, I am Patrick Gallagher. And I think there's a picture of me as a coat and con. And then on Twitter, it's at Patrick G man. And that's me on Twitter. I'll, um, I'll find you on Twitter. And then I have a Facebook page, um, professional page that I don't really pay that much attention to. But I don't know, that nobody really bothers with Facebook anymore. It's all about Instagram with Twitter or close. Yeah. 
And you know what else freaks me out? I apparently still have a MySpace account that I can't remember the password of and can't close down. And it wow. freaks me out a little bit. But I can't put it down. Man. You probably do too. All these people out I there. Did, you yeah, have... I had one. My best mate yeah. had one. Me, me and the two best mates had one. Yeah, we all had one. Did you close it? I don't know, mate. It's been that long since I've been on it. I think I think it might still be there. I haven't looked at it. It scares the crap out of me, and I'm curious, and I can't remember the fucking password. I can't. I, even. I want to. So, go go check your MySpaces because uh, they're still out there. Um, but yeah, that's where I am. I'm on uh, Instagram. I am Patrick Gallagher, and then all lowercase and at Patrick G Man on Twitter. Oh, right, then one last question before I uh, close this interview off. Who would win in a fight and a trash talking contest out of Attila the Hun and Kuntu Khan? Okay, in a fight, it's got to be Coden. I mean, Attila was a happy, loving guy and a very, he had a soft heart. I think he could out trash talk him because he speaks his own language and he just likes to talk. So I like, what? What are you, what are you saying? Yeah. Are you yeah, yeah. And he can say some pretty, I can't even tell you some of the shit. Attila says. But yeah, Coton, I think Coton, I think Coton would be hard pressed to lose a fight to almost anybody, personally. Coton was a badass mofo. So the villain of uh, Ghost of Tsushima would basically win uh, Attila the Hun, despite Attila. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the Attila the Hun that I played in, in 90 BCM. Yeah. Although Attila, Attila, would, Attila, Attila would make a good showing for himself, you know. But uh, I think Coton, Coton had that, had that big, you know, spear axe thing. Yeah, he did. Although Attila in the first one had arrows, so I don't know. Maybe he could just like shoot him, cheat a little bit. Maybe, maybe. Can I call it a tie? Yeah, we'll call it a tie and just so that, no, that none of them fall out of favor with you. If yeah. you ever get we'll, we'll call it a, maybe, a, maybe a split decision, maybe a judge's decision for Coton. But they're both standing at the end. And on that uh, dead heat, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the voice of Kuntu Khan from Ghost of Tsushima, Patrick Gallagher. Thank you very much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Nice to be here. And uh, enjoy the game.